Members of the State Board for Vocational Education, President or Dr. Campbell, President Nelson, staff members of the great college here at Salt Lake, honored guests, and friends and relatives of the graduates and graduating students. I'm indeed grateful for this opportunity to take a few minutes of your time to present a few things which are important, I think, in the world in which we live, in the world in which you face now to endeavor to make a living and to find your niche in this particular world. There are several points that I'd like to make, one dealing with the world now and some of the things that have transpired, some of the things that we are faced with, and what the future holds for us to some degree. To many of you, you've merely started your educational process. As I reflect, some 20 years ago, I completed a program in machine shop operation at one of our state institutions. And as I reflected at that time, wondering just what would take place in the future and what has taken place, a great deal of change has come about. To many of you, there'll, this will be the beginning of some perhaps additional education in a formal way. To many of you, you will receive training and, and uh, assistance as apprentice and working on the job to gain some additional information and help. Hopefully many of you, hopefully all of you, will return to this institution and others to gain additional technical training and skills which will help you in your occupational endeavor. And many of you, perhaps by self-instruction and self-improvement, will see changes and adapt as the need may arise. I'd first like to present some information uh, that to me is fantastic. It's in the world of dreaming and almost unbelievable. And yet it has a direct bearing, I think, on, on your lives, yes, on our lives, each of us, as we face what's ahead of us and as we face the future. Not too many years ago, as a rather young person, I recall reading the Buck Rogers comic strip. And my parents and others and myself, I think, at that time, saying, gee, this is, this is way out, never happened, couldn't possibly be, the guy's crazy. And yet, in not too many years, we've seen the real truths of this old comic strip come about. Talk about space flights, docking in space, individual flying suits, uh, things of this type, these have come about. We've seen them. And there are very few in this audience today who would question the possibility of man landing on the moon within the not too distant future. One of the things that intrigued me about that comic strip was the ray gun. This thing that you point at somebody and shoot and all of a sudden they disintegrate, whether it's a spaceship or an individual or a piece of equipment, gee, that was way out. And yet, you know, today, by the development of the laser beam, this is possible. This to me is a fantastic thing and one of the technologies which we have about us. The laser beam, which is uh, merely a beam of light in a simple term, but very closely directed and aimed and restricted, it serves many functions. This was developed in the late 50s and initiated in the 60s in a commercial way. It can be used as a surgical knife. It can cut, it can scar, it can vaporize, and it can manipulate living tissue. In the past few years, hundreds of patients have had the retinas of their eyes repaired in what used to be a very painless, a very delicate operation with some recovery period to it. Now by the laser beam and the patient very shortly after the operation on the same day is free to leave in practically a painless operation. 
Yet, when you consider what this can do in terms of a manufacturing operation, it can cut one inch metal, it can weld together uh, connections and printed circuits, it can be used for piercing diamond dies, it drills minute holes in jet engine parts, it can remove tattoos from the skin, tumors from the leg, and rejoin blood vessels and things of this type. Now here's something that's fantastic to me, how it can destroy things by cutting as an example through steel and yet repair a delicate thing such as a person's eye uh, is fantastic. There's a great deal of technology and development, a lot of experimentation and a lot of work that's gone into this type of thing. Quoting from uh, a publication by Kaiser Aluminum called The Dynamics of Change, it points out that half of all the energy consumed by mankind in the past 2,000 years has been consumed in the past 100. In mining, as an example, man has taken as much from the earth in, since 1915 as mankind did all in all previous times. It points out that 25% of all the people who have ever been alive on this earth are alive and living today. And 90% of all the scientists, and as you reflect some of your old science books and great names in the scientific field, and yet realizing that 90% of all the scientists who have ever lived are with us today, then it's no wonder that technology changes and that we are facing a tremendous opportunity in this great old nation. The amount of technical knowledge doubles every 10 years. Between this year, 68 and, and 88, there will be five people where three of you are sitting today. William Vogt stated that assuming you have a normal pulse beat, it will not quite keep pace with the increase in the world population. Every time your pulse throbs, the population of the world will have added more than one human being. And of course, if you realize the tree factor, which from two and spreads out, you can realize what this is going to mean in the world population in the future. By 1986, 35% of the people will be less than 15 years of age in the world today. If any of you noticed the paper last night, it indicated the average age of the American citizen this year is 27.7 years. This means that there are as many older than 27 as, as there are younger than 27. So the age continually decreases as the population increases. It's interesting to note that in China today, there are as many individuals 10 years of age and younger as there are total population in Russia. I can understand a little more, I think, why Russia is deeply concerned about China and perhaps why America is concerned about China and our relationship with them. It's been pointed out that there's a possibility here in the United States that within a generation or two, 2% 2 of the population could produce all of the food and the manufactured goods required by the other 98% of the population of the United States. This gives us some idea of the things we are going to have to do to keep pace with the occupational world and the services rendered to individuals as we progress into the next decade or two. As we consider some of the things that have happened in these United States, you know we have about 6% of the world's, pop, uh, the world's land uh, area. We have less than 1 16th of the world's population. And yet the United States has about one third of the world's electrical capacity. 
It has 40% of the electrical products, 41% of the TVs and radios, 27% of the newspapers, 56% of the telephones. There are times when this may not be quite so desirable, but at any rate, this is what technology has done for us. There are 76% of the automobiles and 80% of the bathtubs. And when I was presenting this to my youngsters last night, my 17-year-old and uh, my four-year-old decided this was not necessarily a great advance in the nation of the United States. Looking again at some technologies, from the time of the actual development to commercial adaptation of several products that I'd like to mention to you, because I think this gives you the trend and the idea that is taking place. In photography, it took 112 years. That is, from the time somebody found out how to take a picture till they developed it for a commercial use. 112 years. The telephone, it took 56 years. The radio, 35 years. Radar, it took 15 years. TV, 12 years. The atomic bomb, six years. Transistors, five years. And the laser beam, a year and a half. So the time from discovery to commercial use is continuing to be cut. It makes you wonder just how, how soon or how quick can this be done, and yet it's continuing to decrease and make available to the public these items for commercial use. Today there are 48 million telephones in use, and only in the lowest income families are they absent. The same can be said of automobiles. During the early 1930s, which some of you will remember, few families considered a car other than an extra that could be foregone. Today, with over 70 million automobiles registered in the United States, it is difficult for us to imagine, you, in this day and age, to imagine the family without an automobile and perhaps without one or two. Television arrived in 1948, and within the next eight years, it did the same thing that it took the telephone decades to achieve, changing from a novelty to a near necessity by 1958, with 50 million sets in use. Discretionary spending is also a process where one development pyramids upon another. The U.S. Department of Labor states uh, pointed out that the washing machine, considered a necessity today, would not have been possible in most factory employees' homes in 1900 because their houses lacked running water. Now, those are things that I don't recall the 1900s. They're a little bit before me, but many of you would. And yet, to see the great fantastic change that has taken place in that time. A few of the things that are with us today that have the, we have the capability of performing. I read in the paper about a machine that's used in health occupations, in hospitals. This is a computerized unit. As an example, the doctor will leave a prescription to the machine to administer, for the nurse to administer two aspirins to patient in room number so-and-so at 1 a.m. So at 1 a.m., the machine advises the nurse. If the nurse obeys the machine, the machine prepares a port report to the doctor. It uh, adds the cost of the two aspirin to the patient's bill. It deducts the two aspirins from the inventory of the hospital count, and if the nurse is slow in carrying out the orders, then the machine reminds her again, this time by buzzing and lights and bells, and I suppose it could be, become a real problem. The, the nurse has called it the nagging machine. The doctors thought it had great possibilities. There's a restaurant now in operation in Minneapolis that is run by computer. This is what it will do in a period of time. In one hour, the system can produce over 400 hamburgers, the same number of hot dogs, 
more than 100, 175 entries, and hundreds of drinks. The systems control unit called Orbis, which is for ordering and billing system, at this time it's doing this, it receives a customer's order, it prints out a check, it computes the total, it adds the sales tax, it directs the food and drink producing machines. Another point on automation, this is quoted from What's New in Electronics, and Cohen points out that there is available and the capability today to develop a glass plant, completely automated, which will require 14 employees to run it, and this uh, facility can produce 90% of all the electric light bulbs needed in this country, 100% of the radio and TV tubes, and in its spare time make Christmas tree ornaments. Uh, these things are fantastic. And when you consider them, uh, initially it sounds perhaps like, yeah, they're doing away with all the jobs. But when you take the second look at it and realize in order to develop to this technical state, the equipment, the machines, the backup, who's going to do it, who's going to build it, this is where the graduates of this institution and others similar to it play a key part and an important role. You know, I think uh, another point concerning the product we work with and the worth of things. A bar of iron is worth $5. If you make this same bar into horseshoes, it is worth $10.50. If you make it into needles, it's worth $4,285. If you make it into balance wheels for watches, it's worth $250,000. So a lot depends on what we do with what we have, don't it? Well, it is a challenging future, and we do have a great many things today which are made available to us through the development and work of others. Plutarch stated, it is indeed a desirable thing to be well descended, but the glory belongs to our ancestors. And I think uh, this is well put. The things that we have, we enjoy, not, too, uh, too, uh, not many of them are the results of our own direct re, uh, actions and activities, but belong to our ancestors. They've made a great life for us. Well, why is this important to you then? because these changes in technology will affect your life. They'll affect how you adapt to it. And the important thing is that you prepare and be ready for the future and cut your place in it. And the second thing that I'd like to mention for a few minutes concerns you, concerns people. Because you are important, these things that I've mentioned and talked about for a few minutes, they weren't made by machines. They were made by people. And people are the important thing. And your relationship with your fellow worker, as President Nelson has mentioned, with your boss, with the community you serve, is extremely important. The skills you have learned, of course, is important. And this is a key that unlocks the door, that allows you to start in your occupational field. Having been with a commercial company for a number of years and having studied and read some of the material available on personnel work, the studies indicate that about 75 to 80 percent of employees lose their job because they are unable to relate to a work situation in a personal or personnel way not because they can't turn the screwdriver or push the buttons, but because they have a difficult time relating to the guy next to them or the uh, supervisor or the boss in the company or because they fail to pay bills and have bill collectors chasing the company to get their check and things of this type. So I think this is important to you also. And I know that the school, through the instructors, through the administrative people, have tried to impress us upon you and encourage you to realize it 
and use it as you gain training, not only in the skill, but in the human relations aspect of your job and how to get along with other people. There was a quote, I think, uh, if I recall right, it came from USU on their library, which stated, with all thy getting, get understanding. And I think there's some real food for thought there. How you relate to a personnel man or an employer as you go out to seek employment, how you relate to a foreman or a supervisor, uh, how you enjoy your work, how you enjoy job progress and pay increases, how you relate to each worker, and how you're accepted as a fellow worker will be a great deal on how you feel as an employee and how, how you work out as a worker and how much the job brings satisfaction to you and how happy you are in it. Also important is how you relate to customers. If you happen to be in that type of service where you uh, offer repairs or uh, service to automobiles, some of you will be discussing building plans and so forth with prospective customers. Some of you in the haircutting business as you relate to customers. I've gone back to a few barbers, I suppose, who haven't done too good a job, but I haven't gone back to too many that I didn't feel good about or didn't feel good around because of the way they talked, the language they used, or things of this type. Some of you are fashioning and styling hair that will be dealing with the public directly. Many of you in the business occupations field be working with the public directly. Many of you who will be working for smaller establishments in the machining field, electronics, and sheet metal areas will be dealing with public directly or indirectly. And all of you will be de dealing with public in one way or another and have done so all of your life. Well, how you do it and what you do about it and how you present yourself is important. Perhaps it can be summed up as an attitude. There's a story about Eddie, the slow-moving, inefficient clerk in a small town. <clears throat> he was working in a store, and he was not in one morning. So one of the customers asked uh, the proprietor, where's Eddie? Is he sick? Nope, replied the storekeeper. He's just not working here anymore. That's so, responded the villager. Got anybody in mind to fill the vacancy? Nope, Eddie didn't leave a vacancy. Well, I hope as you work and as I work, if we leave, there's a vacancy. There's one which an employer will hate to see us go. There are a lot of things that money can't buy, too. And here's the list of a few of them, which I think are important to us. Money cannot buy real friendship. Friendship must be earned. Money cannot buy a clear conscience. Square dealing is a price tag. Money cannot buy the glow of good health. Right living is a secret. Money cannot buy happiness. Happiness is a mental attitude. And one may as well be, ha and one may be as happy in a cottage as in a mansion. Money cannot buy sunsets, singing birds, the music of the winds and the trees. These are as free as the air we breathe. Money cannot buy inward peace. Peace is a result of constructive philosophy of life. Money cannot buy character. And these are the things that you must also develop in the world in which you now attempt to make your niche. I've also in the few short years that I've lived, failed to find a perfect job. I've heard people talk about them. I've never found anybody who's really found the perfect job, and I don't suppose you will. There will be things that you will not agree with, but the real opportunity is to take advantage of the things you do like, work to correct the things you don't, and always keep in mind the goal that is ahead of you. It's probably, you know, how we look at things. 
the eye of the beholder or just how things appear to us. And this brings up another little note about a druggist who was making up a prescription for one of his customers. The prescription read, enough poison to cover a dime. As the druggist reached in his pocket, not having a dime, he pulled out two nickels and put the poison to cover the face of the two nickels. The customer wasn't very pleased about it. You know, there's a lot of things that happen in the world from an inquiring mind, an inventive mind, the things that we do. Just a couple of quickies to give you an idea of some of the things that can be done. You know, the person who invented or thought up the idea of using the telephone to call in and find about what time of day it was, what the temperature is, and so forth, in New York City alone, this nets the telephone company four million dollars a year just for this service. Now that's a lot of dimes put in the telephone and yet it serves this purpose. Some guy in the military service decided that gee, uh, GIs don't use watches anymore that they carry in the pocket. Why, why do we have the watch pocket then put in trousers? So they decided to eliminate it and save the government in the purchase of of trousers because of this one thing alone, in one year, $666,000. So there's a lot to be done still, a lot of things that challenge, challenge each of us. Now as you uh, have a start in the occupational world, and as you now attempt to go out and find your niche in the world, by the addition of this training that you've received in this period of time, if it's been a year, you've just added to your gross total income about $58,000. If you've been in training for two years, you can double that. So you have taken some important steps in your total yearly lifetime earnings. Now there's some people that have an interest in you Speaking specifically to the graduates, you have families. They have an interest in you. Perhaps some of you, they have an investment in you in the training that you've received. And many of them have given encouragement and direction to you to seek the training and accomplish where you, what you have today. You yourselves have an investment. If it isn't money, it's certainly time and energy and effort. Your school, the Utah Technical College at Salt Lake, has a great investment in you. In terms of dedication on the part of administrators, the staff people, and specifically the instructors who work directly with you. They're interested in you. They're, they have a desire to see you achieve and accomplish in the world in which you have chosen to use as your occupational field. The State Board for Vocational Education has a great interest in you as a governing body of this institution, as well as a state superintendent and his staff, in seeing that you receive the proper instruction, the right kind of training, which will best prepare you for the world of work. And finally, the state of Utah, the governor of this great state, who is a real staunch supporter of vocational and technical education, the legislature, which is also a great supporter, and we hope uh, will become more so, uh, as President Nelson mentioned, and finally, the people of this state have an investment in each of you of about $600 for each year you receive training. Now, you're expected to pay, play your part in society because of this. It isn't a gift. Perhaps it's an investment, as I mentioned, because through you and by you, others will be helped and you will pay your part of the taxes and response, place the responsibility that you have. Be proud of your training. Be, be proud of the institution, the occupation you represent. Tell people about it. Let them know there is a great school here, a great college, which performs a service to the citizens of this great state. Encourage people to find out about it, to attend it, and to tell other people about it. Well, what I've mentioned and what I've said is we're in a great technical world. The United States, the greatest of any. 
A great many things have happened, a great many things are going to happen, and you play a very important part in it. You, yourselves, your families, the people of the community, and the people of this great nation. What you do and how you do it is important to all of us. Leonardo da Vinci said, Thou givest everything at the price of effort. May you continue to put forth effort and thereby gain the reward that is due you. Thank you very much.